Hello fleet and welcome to Know Your Ship episode 20 with me Chase and today's episode is going to be about the flower class corvettes. But before I get into the details about this particular ship class I would first like to give a huge shout out to the now over 500 subscribers that are following me and encouraging me and supporting me. I would like to thank all of you so much for your support and I will try my best to put up more videos for all of you in the upcoming days and weeks. And if we ever hit like a thousand subscribers, which I hope will be soon, I'll be able to do some kind of giveaway. The details of which I'm still trying to formulate in my head, and I will hopefully figure out when we get there. Aside from that, I also picked up my first troll. Like, not just like a troll person on like content and stuff, but like someone who actually messaged me and said, I will threaten to take down your channel because you're using World of Warships in your video titles. Yep. Reported the dude for harassment, and hopefully nothing comes of it. Now, back to these awesome ships. The Flower Class Corvettes were a small class of warship that was operated by both the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Navy during World War II. Their primary job was to escort convoys and to hunt U-boats whenever the opportunity presented itself. These corvettes were instrumental in helping the Allies win the Battle of the Atlantic. However, much like that campaign, these ships are mostly forgotten by the people today. So I hope sincerely that with this episode, I can teach you all a little bit about these particular classes of ships, you know, and, and the Battle of the Atlantic as a whole, you know, why convoys worked, why, you know, these tactics worked, why they didn't work, what the, the submarines did, what the corvettes did to protect the convoys and, you know, guard against submarines. And hopefully by the end of this entire episode, all of you will have a greater appreciation for the little guys that helped in the war and not just the big capital ships that we've all come to love and remember. So sit back relax and enjoy this episode. The Flower Class Corvette was a small armored escort vessel based on an old 19th century design for a whale catcher. It was easy to build and extremely cheap at just half the cost of a destroyer. An additional advantage was that many improvements could conveniently be made while the ships were still being built. The Corvette was basically a seagoing coastal ship, poorly suited to deep water voyages in the Atlantic Ocean. It rolled severely, quickly exhausting even the fittest crews. Although too slow to overhaul a surfaced U-boat, the flower-class Corvette could cross the full width of the Atlantic Ocean without refueling. With a four-inch gun, six anti-aircraft machine guns, and 40 depth charges, the Corvette would become operational during the most severe escort shortage of the war. Its cheap, fast construction, its long endurance, and its small but deadly armory would make the flower one of the most important Allied weapons of the battle, the mainstay of the British and Canadian convoy defences. Corvette is launched. When it became apparent that Nazi Germany was pinning our hopes on making the seas around Britain impossible for our supply ships, the Admiralty gave orders to every available British shipyard to build this new class of warship to counter the threat. And today, in ever-increasing numbers, new Corvettes are going down the slipways. The first corvettes were built before the war broke out and all bore the name of seabirds. Puffin, Pintail, Shellrig. They looked like miniature destroyers and were in fact built in Admiralty yards. But more and more were needed and civilian yards had to be used. So another class was designed, the flower class. The Sturtium, Primrose, Delphinium. This class can be turned out quickly and in large numbers. Built on the whale catcher lines, they can stand up to the worst Atlantic weather. Their job is to protect convoys. In June 1940, nearly half the Royal Navy's 80 destroyers were deployed in the screen thrown around the south coast of Great Britain to watch for a German invasion. Even more were utilized in formations called search and patrol groups. These had a roving brief to sweep the ocean for prowling U-boats. 
This left the Western Approaches Command responsible for the defense of all Atlantic convoys, with too few destroyers and less than 50 sloops and corvettes. The Western Approaches warships were soon to be based in the ports of Liverpool, Greenock and Londonderry. Later in the battle, Admiral Max Horton would become Commander-in-Chief with his headquarters at Liverpool. The Western Approaches warships initially could only escort the outward bound convoys as far as 12 degrees west, 100 miles west of Ireland. At the 12th meridian, the convoy would have to continue the rest of the 4,000 kilometer journey alone, or with just light defense. The Western Approaches escorts would wait at the edge of their patrol limit to meet the more important homeward bound convoys. There were two types of homeward sailing convoys. The faster convoys formed up at the Canadian port of Halifax, Nova Scotia, and were coded HX. The slow convoys formed up at Sydney, Cape Breton, and were coded SC. For their protection, the Royal Canadian Navy presently had less than 10 destroyers, which could only provide the convoys with a light escort for about 400 miles. In order to keep the European conflict out of American waters, the United States maintained the neutrality patrol out to 300 miles east, which with eight destroyer groups and five Catalina squadrons was for the time being enough to deter any long-range U-boats. East Atlantic air cover was provided by less than 30 RAF Coastal Command squadrons flying from Great Britain. British and Canadian resources were stretched to the full. And even with American help, the convoys faced a huge gap in the middle of the Atlantic with little surface and no air protection. In a typical convoy, the merchant ships would form seven columns, each half a mile apart. The inner three columns with the most valuable or explosive cargoes would contain five vessels and the more vulnerable outer columns would contain four. In column, each ship sailed 600 yards apart. The formation was a broad front rectangle and would occupy a relatively small sea area of six square miles. The box-like formation had been adopted after it was found that long columns tended to string out, not only greatly increasing the visibility of the convoy, but leaving the tail-enders highly vulnerable. The main benefit of the compact rectangle was the resulting short perimeter, along which four or more escort vessels patrolled. The size of a convoy could be considerably increased without the need for a corresponding increase in the number of escorting warships. Maneuvers in convoy were always dangerous, especially for inexperienced crews, and so were kept to a minimum. The Commodore, in a central ship towards the front, ordered the course changes. Early in the battle, this was brought about by the ships on the inside of the turn slowing down while the whole formation wheeled around. However, this method forced the convoy to lose valuable speed. Later in the battle, the wheel was often replaced by a technique that had started out purely as an emergency maneuver. This was a sudden 45 degree turn carried out simultaneously by all vessels. It greatly increased the risk of collision and left the convoy in an echelon that was disconcerting to the ship's captains. But critically, the convoy lost no speed. And with experience, it could be carried out with the ships still maintaining station. Here is one of the flower class taking in final and most important stores. She sets out on anything up to three weeks at sea with a convoy.
ships must be fed as well as men. And the corvette comes alongside the oil tanker to take in fuel. Every minute, day or night, the crew must be prepared for instant action against a determined and ruthless enemy. So one of the first jobs is to inspect guns and offensive equipment. Look, right ahead in the distance, on the horizon. What a grand sight. That's what we've been waiting to see. There the convoy this corvette has been detailed to escort. When we draw nearer, you'll see a motley collection of ships, all shapes and sizes. Besides British, there are Dutch, Greek, Polish, and Norwegian, and all helping in the Allied cause. There are long periods of monotony in the daily life of the crews, but this monotony is lightened by one or two important functions. The crew's daily rum ration. And while we're on the subject of drinks, the mother of these three ten-day-old kittens went ashore to look up a friend and missed her ship. The crew gladly became foster mothers and decided to milk feed the children with a fountain pen filler. A bit of fresh fish is welcome, so hopeful ratings are always ready to try their luck over the rail. One never knows when enemy ears may be lurking around, so any very important or secret messages are passed in this way, when weather permits. But calm conditions like this are the exception rather than the rule. And the Corvette is able to look after herself in the worst that the Atlantic can do, though life aboard can be remarkably uncomfortable when really dirty weather is about. When mealtimes come round, transporting food from the galley is quite a balancing act, but it arrives safely to the hungry wardroom. If that empty raft could speak, it would have a story to tell, perhaps of a tragedy, perhaps of a nick of time rescue, a floating mine. In its present state, it's a danger to shipping, so the crew proceed to dispatch it with machine gun fire. Occasionally, a mine will explode when hit. More often, it sinks to the bottom, like this one. And under the sea, there's another lurking danger, the U-boat. One of the escorting warships has detected something on her anti-submarine instruments. This is where the corvette comes into her own. She was built for just such an occasion. And the vast explosions of her depth charges seal the fate of any U-boat in the vicinity. Mines and U-boats are not the only danger. This convoy is an important one, and the enemy launches his attack from the air as well as from the sea. A message has just been flashed to warn us that hostile aircraft have been shadowing us and are now coming in to attack. Every man knows his essential function and gets about his job. Here the blighters come. Not many of them, but quite enough. Now you'll see what a bombing attack looks like at sea. That's typical of life in the Corvettes. Many hours with nothing happening at all, and when it does, often nothing decisive to show for it, except the one vital fact, the convoy gets through. No wonder these men feel able to deal with any problem they're called on to face, except, of course, downright magic. 
and one other problem they couldn't solve. The storm proved too strong for all their efforts at foster mothering, and this sole survivor is left to become the ship's mascot. The work of the corvette goes on, week in and week out, doing their vital bit to help win the battle of the seas for those nations that have pledged themselves to fight for freedom in this life and death struggle. There are many types of British warships out there playing their part. There is none more important than the corvette. By late August 1940, the German Navy was able to intercept and decrypt British naval signals early enough to mount powerful attacks. This allowed Admiral Dönitz to try out long-planned tactics to defeat the convoys. Dönitz, as a First World War U-boat commander, had already fought against convoys and anticipating that the Allies would once again use the system, had developed a tactic to defeat it. Dönitz now had enough U-boats and good enough intelligence to implement the Rudel tactic, better known as the Wolf Pack. The Wolf Pack, given advance warning by German intelligence, would be disposed in a chain, often several hundred miles long, across the suspected course of a convoy. When one U-boat sighted the merchant ships, it then radioed the convoy's position and course back to headquarters. Headquarters then alerted all the nearest U-boats and vectored them towards the target. Once the U-boats found their prey, each commander was free to choose his own position from which to attack. Most remained a safe distance beyond the escorts and launched a fan of torpedoes at the convoy's flank. They hoped that out of four or five torpedoes aimed into the middle of the convoy, one or more would hit a ship. However, the bravest U-boat commanders waited for nightfall. They sailed slowly on the surface, evading the underwater detectors, steamed straight through the escort perimeter screen and right in amongst the merchant vessels. The U-boat's low silhouette and the inexperience of convoy lookouts enabled the commander to wreak havoc by picking off individual targets at almost point-blank range. As soon as a submarine attack began, the merchant vessels and their escorts immediately fired hundreds of flares and star shot, lighting up the sky in an attempt to reveal the U-boat's position. Even if they did see the enemy, at such short range, the escorts were unable to depress their deck guns low enough to hit the target. The escorts could still ram the submarine, but often, before they had a chance to do so, the U-boat had dived. The problem for the escorts now was finding the enemy. The German submarines usually stayed shallow, knowing that the Allied ASDIC underwater detector beam was at its most unreliable near the surface. Even if the escorts did discover the U-boat, they could still only fire depth charges from the stern. This meant they had to sail right over the enemy, and in so doing would lose ASDIC contact, and therefore any accuracy they might have had. At close range, the U-boats had all the advantages. The most steel-nerved U-boat commanders remained near the surface and close to a merchant ship. They bided their time until the panic was over, then quietly slipped away. The first real chance for the Kriegsmarine to form wolf packs came in early September 1940. The tactic soon proved devastatingly successful. Again and again, the U-boats ambushed lightly defended convoys, and by the end of the month, 59 Allied merchant ships had been sunk, the highest monthly total yet. In 
In early October, German intelligence decrypted several British naval signals that gave them four days' notice of a slow convoy, SC-7, sailing from Canada. The Germans knew not just its time of departure, but also its course and speed. The nearest U-boats were immediately formed into a powerful wolf pack and placed in the path of the oncoming convoy. Convoy SC-7 contained 34 merchant ships and was sailing south of Iceland, escorted by a single sloop. On October the 15th, U-124, one of a screen of U-boats several miles apart, sighted a straggler, sank her, and the next morning found the rest of the convoy. It radioed headquarters and quickly sank three more merchant ships before being forced to submerge by the escort. U-boat headquarters immediately vectored in six submarines. An additional sloop and a flower corvette arrived from Western Approaches Command, but to little effect. Over the next two days, the six U-boats managed to sink 16 of the 30 remaining merchant ships. 60% of the entire convoy, more than 100,000 tons, were destroyed by the Wolfpack, without the loss of a single submarine. In the four months from June to October 1940, called the Happy Time, the U-boats had sunk 274 ships at one and a half million tons for the loss of just six submarines. The Wolf Packs had comprehensively demonstrated their superiority over the convoy defences. At this rate of destruction, Great Britain, despite enforcing a strict rationing programme, was going to be six million tons of imports short of the minimum required to maintain existence. In November 1940, the U-boat's happy time finally came to an end, when fierce storms sweeping through the North Atlantic forced many to withdraw. Since the beginning of the battle, the British had been researching how best to use the few escort ships they had. One result was the development of the escort group. The escort group was perfected by Captain John F. Walker, who was later knighted for killing two submarines in a single morning. The group was a formation of small warships, which, unlike the failed search and patrol groups, would operate in close consort with the convoys. Later in the battle, when there were more than enough warships, the more successful escort groups would be given complete independence and renamed support groups. These would move from convoy to convoy, protecting the merchant ships through the most dangerous stretches of ocean. The escort group travelled in close consort with a convoy and was usually made up of corvettes and destroyers. When a U-boat was detected, the group would break off from the convoy, leaving just enough permanent escorts to secure the perimeter. The group would bring maximum firepower to bear on the submarine, inflicting as much damage as possible and forcing it to dive. The escorts then had to find the submarine with their ASDIC underwater detectors. The warships sailed line abreast three or four miles apart, maximizing the area of sea covered. Once ASDIC contact was made, then the escorts launched a barrage of depth charges, either destroying the U-boat or forcing it to the surface where the wounded U-boat would be shelled or rammed. No escort group would ever give up the hunt until its prey was destroyed or had clearly escaped. The first four escort groups at Western Approaches supported convoys as far as 35 degrees west. 
In May, the Royal Canadian Navy received eight new destroyers and 20 corvettes, which meant that now, for the very first time in the battle, the convoys could be given full surface protection right across the Atlantic. The Regina is indeed small. A flower-class corvette, she measures barely 200 feet long and 45 feet wide. In the Second World War, the tiny corvettes have the daunting task of escorting convoys of essential supplies across the Atlantic. German U-boats attack constantly. The miniature warships are often all that stand between them and their massive cargo-carrying targets. The Canadian Navy comes of age in the Second World War, and the, the craft that really makes it happen is the flower-class corvette. It's the largest class of vessels ever run by the Canadian Navy. This is the Sackville, the Regina's sister ship. It's the only Second World War corvette left in the world. These ships are small, agile, and equipped to defend the convoy against submarines. The function of the corvette primarily is to keep the ships moving and provide a communications link between the convoy and shore authorities. So they're really our sheepdogs. The Regina is commissioned on January 22, 1942. She takes up her post on the North Atlantic convoy routes. Later that year, after the Allied invasion of North Africa, she steams to the Mediterranean. On the 8th of February, 1943, she has her greatest triumph. She captures and sinks the Italian submarine, Avorio. Crew morale is at an all-time high under skipper Harry Freeland. I think we could have uh, taken on the world, really, at that point. They were all so uh, thrilled, and we heard nothing but comments and praise for our skipper. Feelings are mixed when Freeland is given another command. A new captain joins the ship, Lieutenant Jack Radford. It was like night and day from Freeland to Radford. Now all of a sudden you've got an unknown quantity up on the bridge and you don't know what he's gonna do uh, until you get in action and then it may be too late. Jack Radford takes the Corvette back to the Atlantic and then takes part in the Allied invasion of Normandy. After D-Day, the Regina escorts endless convoys ferrying supplies to northern France. Weeks pass without incident. August the 8th is a, just a typical day. They've been doing this at this point for two months, back and forth, back and forth. Not much happening. We were going down the Irish Sea towards the English Channel, and we were a head ship because there was no, no other escort. We had no, no help. We'd done this run quite often <laughs> and never had any, any problems, never. The sea was absolutely mill pond. Calm, I'd never seen it so calm. There was no wind at all. I was right at the very stern where the depth charge rails were. I was on the bridge. That was where I was busy getting the radar set ready for the readings coming on during the night. I happened to be on the port signal projector. I'd been up there for quite some time because I was on watch. We're zigzagging up ahead and you have to kind of stay in a lane because there's minefields all around and if you get out of the lane, you're done for. the explosion on the western and everybody raced outside to see what was going on. We we're all gawking at watching that ship sink. The sinking was very slow motion and uh, was not uh, detectable as a sinking from the naked eye. Signal the Ezra Weston. Find out what's wrong. Yes, sir. The skipper 
decided that we'd go back and investigate what was going on. We made a complete sweep around the convoy, picked up nothing on our sonar machine, and the Western was slowly, very slowly, sinking by the bow. Our skipper had gone over several hundred feet, I would imagine, we were from the ship. The crew of the Ezra Weston had launched their lifeboat and were rowing towards us. I could see them. Jack Wynn says, we better get some scramble lights out here. And believe it or not, he cut the engines on our ship. All engines stop. feel the vibration through the ship. And, and some of the fellows had wondered, why are we stopped? We were more or less floating with a the tide there. To stop engines in such a situation is nothing but foolhardy. We were thrown by the blast back across the deck, and then a huge wave came and engulfed me. And it was a churning of water, and I didn't know whether you were going up, down, sideways, or what. The torpedo hit on our port side, right amidships, and that's right where our munitions are. Anybody that was in an enclosed space didn't have a chance. I was raised up past the yard arm, almost to the top of the mast, and I thought, this is a crazy way to die. Everything shimmered, and I looked up there, and I saw a great white flash, and, and then I don't remember anything until I was down deep in the water. I was prepared to jump. I didn't have to jump. The water was right there. The ship was going down that quick. I swam over, and the group that I happened to get with, one of my buddies, George Mann, was there. So what I did when I got over to him, I just held on to his left shoulder with my right hand and uh, floated there. A lot of guys cried for their mother. You know, the distress must have been terrible. I heard that for years. Such was the power of the explosion. Anyone inside the ship didn't stand a chance. Out of the 96 crew, 30 never made it. The bow was straight up facing the sky and sinking very rapidly. The funnel appeared to be headed toward me. And as it kept tilting further toward me, I thought for sure it was going to come over and knock me under. And then it was gone. There was nothing there, and I didn't see anything else around at all. 28 seconds from the time it hit till the time the Regina disappeared. Joseph Howe said, a wise nation preserves its monuments and celebrates its glorious deeds. We have a real burden of responsibility as Canadians to do what we can to make sure that icons like this are simply not allowed to rust away. And of course, the generations, as they go by, they're getting less and less of the story. We've still got to strive somehow or another to get the story across to the Canadian public to make sure that the preservation of this ship is a sure thing. And celebrating this important priority of the Second World War would be a fitting piece of that emerging nationhood, sense of national identity. World War II was, to a dominant degree, a war of supply by sea. 
the Navy up until the Second World War was really a, a flotilla of the Imperial Fleet. Uh, I know it was owned by the government of Canada, it was the Royal Canadian Navy, but psychologically, in terms of its action, it really belonged to the Imperial Fleet. By early 1943, the ferocity of the Bath Atlantic went up almost like a tan curve. The losses uh, of the merchant shipping, the tankers, the ones carrying tanks and guns, munitions and so on, and food for the United Kingdom were far outstripping the capability to rebuild. And so any escort was absolutely vital. This is where Canada stepped into the breach. And Canada ordered corvettes, of which Sackville was one of the three to be built in the Maritimes in St. John. They roared like hell, they pitched like hell, out into the, some of the most perilous, awful ocean voyages in the world, plus the fact of being in uh, imminent danger of being sunk. So she saw the heaviest action, of course, on North Atlantic and was in uh, a number of U-boat chases. And of course, this ship lasted uh, her whole career, 1941, right through to the end of the war. Well, I joined the Canadian Navy in 1940 out of St. John, New Brunswick. And these small corvettes look so exciting and, and challenging and a, a lot of fun could be had, we thought, at the time. I guess that sort of motivated us to head that direction. So yeah, there's a lot of people from Toronto, there's a lot of people from the prairies, there's a lot of people from BC, a lot of people from Quebec, fewer from the Maritimes, virtually in proportion to their national distribution of population. So it really is a broad national experience. To be truthful, None of us were really qualified to do that job in retrospect, but it worked. Sackville is, uh, it's not just our victory, uh, HMS victory, in the, in the way that that's embodied in the Royal Navy. I think it's much more than that. It represents a, a real transition from colonial status to national status. So for me, the ship embodies the growth of Canada as a country and its assertion of its own independence and its own, if you like, maturity. And the joy of the people of Canada swept aside all the wartime hurt as they welcomed back their sons, fathers, and sweethearts. So after the war, uh, you Canadians, you were really good at convoy escort and anti-submarine warfare. That's what you should do as part of NATO. And so the Saint Laurent class escort destroyers come directly out of that lineage. And of course, in the 1950s, Canada becomes a world leader in anti-submarine technology, tactics, and doctrine. So amazing that this relatively small country could produce a navy large enough to be given the command of the Western North Atlantic. So I think the legacy here is very clear. This is where it really starts in terms of the modern Canadian Navy. Well, that's what it is, history. And that history has got to be getting the story across to the public and how to do that is a challenge, there's no doubt about it. Our vision is that we will build a destination that will attract all Canadians. So they will see the soul of the Navy, HMCS Sackville. The overall complex will consist of, and we hope iconically designed, a beautiful building that is also appropriate within the Halifax waterfront. In conjunction with that, there will be a Naval Heritage Center and see the whole history of the Navy since 1910 and understand where the Navy came from, its great achievements, and where it's going in the future. We need interest in our servicemen and women, and this whole ship for one. It's estimated that there's somewhere between a million and a half and two million Canadians who have some family connection to the Navy. This is going to be a, an overall national effort. So it is an artifact not only of the Canadian experience, but it's an artifact of an era, and it has international significance because of what she represents for the Battle of the Atlantic. This is the only ship that survives, and so having this ship is to evoke that connection with what really were glorious days for Canada. And that's all folks for this episode on the Flower Class Corvettes. If you like this video and you like what I'm doing, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel as I'll be uploading more episodes in the upcoming days and weeks. Now the Flower Class Corvettes will not be in World of Warships, so I would like to take this time to dedicate this particular episode to the memory of these little ships and their brave crews that contributed so much to the Allied war effort during World War II. And on that note, I would like to wish you all a great week, and I'll see you all on the high seas soon.